98 FM. Dublin Talks. Call 6797 And good morning from Adrian Kennedy and how are you this morning? I hope everything is good with you and I hope you can stay with us between now and uh, midday today. We have a lot of stuff to get through on the programme, including a a little bit later on I'll be hearing from a secondary school teacher who is supporting uh, suggestions of a secondary school teacher strike. Um, But we're we're going to be asking uh, a little bit later on how safe you feel in your workplace with uh, the current pandemic because it appears that uh, secondary school teachers don't feel overly uh, safe. Uh, We'll be talking about that uh, a little bit later on. But before all of that, um, cleaning the oven... (laughs) I want you to have a think about this for a second. Cleaning the oven has been um, branded the uh, household chore that people most hate doing. And we all have that little thing around the house that... Oh, it's just a pain in the you-know-what. Well, cleaning the oven, as I said, has been voted as the most despised of all household chores. It's the one that people dread. In fact, we dread it so much in our house, we get a man. We call the man, and the man comes and cleans the oven for us. Um, I, I know you can get these kits and you put all the gear in, uh, all this, you know, the shelves and everything from the uh, oven in, and it's just a pain in the you-know-what. So, I want to find out uh, from you, what is that one household chore that you just despise? Send me a WhatsApp voice note right now to 0877 987 98 I'm not a big fan of cleaning windows either. <laughs> it's just not my thing. Uh, so we asked around the office today, Jeremy, for example... And I'm with you on this one. We agree on this one. Uh, Jeremy hates unclogging hair from the shower. Oh, yeah. I hate it myself, I have to say. It just does my head in. Uh, You know, when you have to lift the thing up and then uh, down underneath there in the... Oh, and you have to pull them all out. And dump them into the toilet. It's horrible. Katie... Um, our Katie hates changing the bed sheets. Now I don't mind doing the bed sheets if I've uh, if herself is around and I'm doing them with her, um, which is great. That's it's no problem. But doing it on my own, I did it on my own yesterday. Believe it or not, as uh, as it happens, and it takes three times as long for me. And I end up standing up on the top of the bed, shaking down the duvet to make sure it's all in place. Uh, it's a job I hate. I absolutely hate uh, changing the bed sheets on my own. So I want you to send me a WhatsApp voice note to 0877 989898 and let me know that one household chore that you just can't stand. You just, oh, it just wrecks your head having to do it. Send me a WhatsApp voice note to 0877 989898. 0877. 0877- Seven seven ninety eight ninety eight ninety eight, and let me know that one household chore that you just can't stand. And you know, when you when you know you have to do it, you just keep putting it on the long finger. You never um, get around to doing it. Six seven nine seven ninety eight one is our telephone number, or you can send us a WhatsApp voice note to oh eight seven seven ninety eight ninety eight ninety eight, like Fran just did. Morning, Adrian. My name is Fran. My wife does all the washing and she puts it in a basket at the end of the week and it has to be folded and put away. So I came up with an idea of telling her I hate doing it. But there's a reason why I tell her I hate doing it. She hates when I sit there and watch the football on a Saturday or a Sunday. So what I do is I say, oh, I'm about to do that basket of clothes today. Yeah, you wouldn't mind, hon, would you? No, oh, right, go on, I'll do it then. Well, sure, the reason I'm doing it is because the football's on. So she's happy with me cleaning the laundry, mm-hmm. but I'm happy because I get to watch the football. So Come on, friend, everyone's happy, everyone's happy. Uh, I'd like to hear from you on 67979981. You can send us a WhatsApp voice note to 0877 Peter, what's that one household chore that you can't stand? Oh, God, even thinking about it right now, Adrian, they're bloody dishes. 
I hate doing the dishes. Now, do you, do you have a dishwasher? <laughs> no. Oh, right. Yeah. Yeah. I don't have enough room for a dishwasher. But the one part, you know, like I don't mind doing plates. I, you know, they're quick. Wax on, wax off. Yep. In you go. It's the bloody knives and forks, Adrian. Oh, it's them. tedious. Now, I have to be oh. honest with you. I very rarely wash in the sink unless our dishwasher is full. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, if the, if the dishwasher is full and there's a bit left over, I'll wash them in the sink. But it's... Um, oh. The thoughts of not having a dishwasher, actually, I'll be honest with you, um, I couldn't cope. I just you couldn't... know, we've, 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 over the years, right, because we've, we, we've rented, right, it's just a lot of the places just don't have dishwasher and don't have enough space. And we've always just sort of... You know, just get on with it and done it. But it's just one thing, Adrian. When I see them, I just, I, I, I nearly run. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, well, I, I'll be honest with you. I would be like that. I remember the joy and excitement in our house when we got our very first ever dishwasher. It was like, oh, oh, oh my god! It was, and I, and to this day, I love the machine because you just <laughs> pile it up, and two hours later, your dishes are spotless. You see, and that, that's 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 my idea of of a grey home, Adrian. Mm. A grey home is one with a good dishwasher. Absolutely. I yeah. No. I, 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 and I'll be honest with you, if if. If our dishwasher packed in today, I would have one delivered by tomorrow because yeah. uh, I just couldn't cope. I could well, not cope. Well, I, I tell you, you know, Adrian, I'm going to get one. Yeah. I think I'm going to have to buy the uh, uh, Absolutely. All right, Peter, thanks Hi. very much indeed. 67979081 is our phone number. Or you can send us a WhatsApp voice note to 0877 98 98 98. What is that one chore around your house that you absolutely hate. A lot of you uh, messaging us about cleaning the oven, and that uh, Laura and Clondalkin just did. Um, and that has been voted the most uh, despised household chore. And like I said, uh, if we need to clean our oven, we get the man. And the man comes and cleans the oven. Great service, actually. Uh, this is from Rebecca. My um, worst household chore has to be hoovering or changing the bed sheets. I absolutely hate it. Don't mind the hoovering. Um, that, that doesn't bother me, but the bed sheets. Oh. Rebecca, I'm totally with you, especially um, bed sheets when you have to do them on your own. If you have somebody to do them with you, it's grand. But if you're doing them on your own, it's tedious. Uh, Luke has a, a little bit of a weird one. Standing on the bin, Adrian. My ma always makes me go out and do it. Puts about 40 bags into the black bin. Go out and stand on that there, will you? Stood in beans and all the other day. Ah. Be wrecked. It's Luke here. I only ever stand in our green bin. And the only reason I end up having to stand in our green bin is I missed the delivery or the collection day. And I have done it. I did actually the green bin only last week because I missed the collection. And uh, But I don't know. I've never stood in the black bin. Yeah. No. Uh, Jeff sent me this. Morning, Adrian. Go in the bottle bank. The absolute worst chore in the world. There's two full bags of bottles beside my dishwasher. And I, I don't want to do I love the bottles. love the beer. I hate going in the bottle bank. <laughs> it is a bit of a chore, I have to be honest. Um, we keep ours in uh, a kind of a, a plastic box outside. And then I'm always the one who brings them to the bottle. I don't think anyone in our house has ever been to the bottle bank except me. But anyway, um, it is a bit of a tedious chore. I don't mind it. Put plastic gloves on and away you go. Um, Joanne, you're on 98 FM. Hi, Joanne. Hi, are you, Adrian? Joanne, what is that one household chore that you always put on the long finger because you can't stand it? The weekly grocery shop, Adrian. I despise it. Why? It's just a vein of my life. I hate having to think about what to do for dinners for the week, skill lunches for the week. It just uh, wrecks me out. Are you somebody who goes to the shops with, or goes to the supermarket with a list? No, it's all in my head. I'll go to the press, I'll see what I need, and then I'll go down and I'm just all from my head. I know what I need. But even if I try to change up the dinner some week, yeah. the kids are on. We don't like this. this. We don't like that one. Why can't we have what we had last? But then if I put on the table what I had last week, they're moaning because we had this the other day. It's just no. Right, so it's a, it's a tedious chore for you doing the weekly shopping uh, and making uh, sure that you keep everyone happy. Yes. Yeah. I'll normally do my weekly shop on a Thursday, but I will 
most weeks I try to stretch it out until a Saturday and maybe even possibly a Sunday. <laughs> you hated that much? Oh, yes. Actually, yeah. Sunday isn't a bad day to do your weekly shop, I have to say, because the, the supermarkets aren't overly busy on a Sunday, especially a Sunday afternoon. Um, it's, yeah. not, it's not bad. All right. It's, th- not even, it's not even the people out here. It's just the thought of having to go. Yeah, no, I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I get it. I get it. All right. Thanks, uh, Joanne. Six seven nine seven ninety eight one is our telephone number. Mandy hates absolutely nothing. Hi, Adrian and Jeremy. I'm a woman. So I don't get a choice whether I like a job or not in the house. I just have to do them. No problem. I enjoy it when everything's nice and clean and sparkly. So I'll do everything from washing the oven, pair of holes in the bins, you name it. I'll do it. Mandy, please come around to our gaff, will you? You can do all that for us as well. Power hosing the bins. God, I haven't done that for a long time. I must do. Our brown bin smells like you know what. It's vile. So the next time it gets collected, I'm going to have to power hose our brown bin. Elaine sent me this WhatsApp voice note to 0877 98 98 98 about that one chore that she hates. Let's have a listen to um, Elaine. I absolutely hate putting clean clothes away. Um, I've no problem washing, drying and ironing them, but putting them away absolutely grinds me gears. <laughs> um, yeah, I put them away every day so that I don't have one big huge load to put away at the end of the week. Fair enough. Thank you very much, Elaine. Here's another one. Morning, Adrian. I hate doing the weekly grocery shopping. The task of having to think about dinners for the week, school lunches for the week, it drives me insane. That's oh, was thing. she not just on the air a second ago? I would say she was, yeah. Wendy sent me this. Hi, guys. My one hate I really, really detest doing is Hoover and the Stairs in London. Me and Henry end up having blue murder. <laughs> I don't mind doing that. It doesn't really bother me. Uh, Kira, you're on 98 FM. Hi, Kira. Morning, Adrian. How are you? Kira, what is that one household chore that you just can't stand? Oh, God. I think it's a fairly common one, actually. Just ironing. I hate ironing. I don't think I've ironed anything in about four years, to be honest with you. Really? It. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I actually don't. It. I don't mind ironing because what I usually do is I'll um, I'll set up my iPad uh, in front of where I'm ironing and I'll watch some program or something just to keep me occupied um, while I'm ironing. I actually find it uh, kind of therapeutic, nearly. So t- the oh, I can relate. I can relate to that one because I remember years and years ago, my mother used to iron if she was kind of like down in the dumps about something yeah. so if I would come home and I saw her ironing I was like oh oh, oh what's wrong oh bad god day what's, today. what's, what's yeah, wrong yeah, yeah bad day today what's wrong what's wrong but no I just couldn't be I used to I used to actually iron everything I don't know what happened to me so when you I say you haven't ironed iron. in years your clothes must be in bits are they not no is there no shirts to iron in your house no no, nobody wears shirts. Oh, right, women okay. in my house. Oh, well, women, right. <laughs> now, shirts is our thing in our house. I iron a yeah. lot of shirts. Um, and when you have a, when you have a bit of extra weight like me, when you, when you put the clothes on, it earns the clothes out. <laughs> now you said that. I didn't say that. No. I'll say it. I'll say yeah, it. No, and, and, and there, there's a, a message just a second ago from Annie, and she says, "I love ironing. I find it so relaxing." And, uh, well, I love. Um, I love. I love cleaning the oven. Actually, I'll go back to that other guy a few minutes ago. I'm, I, in some ways, I must be very lazy because one job I actually hate doing is emptying the dishwasher. Don't Do ask you? me why. Don't I, I think it's. I don't know why I hate. No, it it's doesn't. The easiest job in the world. Yeah, it is the easiest I job in the world. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, that I, doesn't bother I me. Hate, but I don't know why I hate you. Need to, you butter, need to re embrace ironing and see it as, uh, as me time. Oh. Okay, no. see it as me time. Um, uh, you know, basically... Well, me time is attacking the rest of the house. Like, I find... Um, like, when my house is clean, I, I just get this really kind of relaxed feeling as if I've just been for a massage or something. And if the house is messy or dirty, I feel all tense and, like, oh, stressed. And mm, mm. So the, the whole cleaning process is therapeutic to me. 
Okay, so the ironing is your number one. Um, yeah, the ironing Like I said, is for one, me, yeah. uh, doing a bit of ironing is me time. In fact, I have to do a bit of ironing this afternoon, and uh, no bother, not a bother. Well, you can drop over to me then later, okay? All right, good. <laughs> I'm okay. still in Dublin, so you're all right. Thanks, Kira. Uh, six seven nine seven ninety eight one is our phone number, or send us a WhatsApp voice note to oh eight seven seven ninety eight ninety eight ninety eight. This is Jean's household chore that she can't stand. First household chore in my eyes is trying to match socks together, and you always find you have one odd sock. Jean Craig's. And it, it's something I've never understood. I have never understood. I've this kind of if I'm putting socks in the washing machine, I'll kind of. Um, I put them in together and they tend to make it back out together but I only a couple of weeks ago I threw out about seven socks because their uh, twin uh, brother had disappeared off the face of the earth um, I, hope, I hope you're not eating as we speak with this message from Claire Oh my god the one thing I can't stand is hair in the shower like everyone in the family slags me about it because I get freaked out with the hair um, and then I got three bottles of this Buster Plug Hole Unblocker Bathroom Dissolves Hair and Sludge Stops Slow Draining Water. I was like, oh, my life's end. <laughs> and here's a follow on from Claire. Yes, hair in the shower also makes me feel literally sick. Oh, right. Okay. Thank you, Claire. Uh, it's, it's a horrible chore. And uh, when I'm doing it, I get down on my knees and I pull it all out and I drop it in the toilet and I flush the toilet. <laughs> um, is this Michael um, has bought a very fancy Hoover? I used to hate down the Hoover and the, the, I despised it. Lugging that lump of yoy up the stairs. But I have this new Hoover now that has headlights on it. It's <laughs> awesome. <laughs> what Hoover has headlights on it, Michael? I, I, I need to get one. Uh, why do you want headlights on a Hoover, anyway? Uh, this is uh, Jay, the first person to mention this. Oh, lads, gardening. No, no, no. I do anything. Dishes, hoovering, bedding, ironing. But ask me to go out and cut the grass or do any weeding or anything like that. My God almighty. No, you're grand. Between spiders and flies and wasps and ah, <laughs> oh, go away, slugs and all and oh, no, I just hate gardening. Hate it. Oh, jeez. You should move to an apartment, Jay. You don't get any slugs in an apartment. Phil sent me this. Morning, Adrian. My missus hates doing the laundry basket with the socks and jocks in it, especially all my boxer shorts. She came in there the other day and she says, I've 19 pairs of boxers in it. <laughs> JD! Good morning, Adrian. JD. I actually hate cleaning the windows inside and outside, especially when she's there. Because she keeps saying, oh, look at the corner. You missed a bit. You missed a bit. Sometimes you have to put her head through it. Swear to God, I hate doing the cleaning. Look. Yeah, I, I wouldn't be a fan of it myself. And Robbie got a lovely surprise this morning. My job every day is to come downstairs and make sure that the kitchen is kind of tidy and clean and do the dishwasher. And uh, I just came down there now this morning because I'm being very lazy and the dishwasher wasn't even on last night, so everything can just go straight in. don't even have to empty it. I'm absolutely delighted. That's made me morning. <laughs> oh, it's amazing what... Uh... Um, satisfies people. Um, now, apparently, the uh, shark vacuum has a uh, has headlights. Why you'd want headlights on a vacuum cleaner is a bit of a mystery to me, but I'm just googling them uh, here as we speak. And a uh, shark vacuum cleaner has headlights. Yes, I can see it there. It's kind of it looks a bit like a kind of a Dyson, uh, but yep, yeah, has headlights if you want a vacuum cleaner with uh, headlights. And uh, finally, back to the socks. And we were talking about how uh, socks just disappear off the face of the earth. And in fact, I know somebody who had to take the um, washing machine apart a couple of weeks ago, uh, got inside the washing machine, and there were no socks. So where do they go to? If they're not inside the washing machine, where do they go to? But back to the socks. Um, just get all the same socks and no matching needed anymore. I get all black done socks, job done. 
Yeah, that, uh, that's all well and good if they're um, all absolutely identical, but even if they're different shades of black. No, no. Anyway, thank you very much indeed. They are all the household chores that some of us love and some of us hate. You're listening to 98 FM's Dublin Talks. This is Adrian Kennedy, uh, and we're here until uh, midday today. Now, I have a bit of a warning for you. If you have uh, young ears around... You might want to take them uh, away. Hopefully they're at school. But if not, you might want to take young ears away from the radio for our next item after the break. Uh, A shocking story of how after only five years, a man who abused his two stepdaughters is already free from prison. We'll find out about that story next. The sound of the city from Adamstown to Artane. This is 98FM's Dublin Talks with Adrian Kennedy. Once again, if you have young ears around, uh, we would ask you to uh, make sure that they are taken away from the radio because the next conversation is a little bit upsetting, actually. A convicted paedophile was released from prison yesterday and is back on our streets having just served five years in prison. John Joe Patterson's stepdaughters are speaking out today as they believe he could be a threat to others. Their names are Emma and Vanessa Witherow and we spoke to them back in 2015 on this programme when their father wa- uh, stepfather was uh, jailed. In fact, they gave their first interview to us at that time. The two sisters bravely waived their right to anonymity after their stepfather was jailed back in 2015 for sexually abusing them when they were children. 60-year-old Patterson was sentenced to eight years in November 2015 with the final 18 months uh, suspended. And he was released yesterday from the Midlands prison in Port Leash after serving less than five years years. Emma and uh, Vanessa say that he showed no signs of remorse and now fear that he could be a threat to uh, others. And the two ladies uh, join me on uh, two different lines. Uh, Vanessa and uh, Emma, good morning to both of you. Good morning. Vanessa, um, or sorry, Emma, let me start with you if I may. You're the older of the, of, of the two of you. Um, yeah. Remind us, because I think people need to uh, hear the severity of the crime um, and the fact that five years later, he's back on our streets again. Tell me about the the abuse that you and uh, Vanessa uh, went through when you were children. Well, it started when we were nine. Um, I don't want to go into too much of the detail or whatever, but it was always under my clothes. Um, it's just, it's horrendous to go through that for somebody that was living with us that was like a father figure mm. they stepped in because mommy and daddy had stiff um, it's, it's just it's just horrible so initially when uh, when your mother got with this man he was a f- relatively normal father figure type of person yeah, um, he moved in when I was six, and for the first three years, it was like any household. Mm. We, it was great Christmases, um, we go on holidays, to know we'd have family meals, it was just normal. And then when I was turned nine, it just all went downhill after that. Now, Vanessa, you're the younger of uh, both of you. What are your earliest memories of the abuse that you suffered at this man's hand? Yeah, I was also nine as well um, when it started. Um, we were actually, he owned a quad bike and we used to get spins on, which we thought, you know, was great. Up and down the road, still spin. Um, when he threw his leg around me and sitting directly behind me and groomed me. Um, that was the first memory and I always try not to put myself in a situation then like I'd never go on the quad bike after that then and you know it was hard you know the other kids getting a spin and I just didn't want it because I didn't want that happening to me again mm-hmm. um, it was uh, yes it was it was it was horrific for to, it was nine years of age I didn't know what was going on but I knew it was uncomfortable and I didn't like it so I just that's why I never went back on the quad bike again 
And this went on for both of you for uh, a number of years to the point that uh, Emma, uh, my, I understand when you reached the age of 18, you upped and left, basically. Yeah. Um, I decided I had enough. And at this point, I didn't know that anything was happening to Vanessa. So when I decided to move out, I had the house organised. I had friends in Templemore that organised my house um, and I had to deposit paid, everything. And I told Vanessa, pack stuff, you're coming with me, I'm not leaving you here. And I went up and told them, my mother and him. And I remember it was the biggest thing to even go up to, from my room to the sitting room to tell them that I was moving out. Um, he stood up and said, you're not going anywhere. Um, for the first time ever, because I never stood up to him. I said, it's nothing got to do with you, and I'm taking Vanessa with me, and we left the next day, and we never turned back. And at what point did you discover that your uh, little sister had been suffering the same sort of abuse? Um, I think actually not till 2010 when I decided that I'd go and report because I had enough. That we, I kind of had an inkling that it was happening to her at that stage because she was happy to come with me from home. Um, but we never spoke about it. Mm. Even now, I know it's come up and we're speaking about it a bit more, but we still haven't sat down as sisters and actually spoke about it. Mm. But you were united in the fact that abuse did happen to both of you. Yeah. Um, and y- you decided to pursue it, and that ultimately led to uh, his conviction in uh, 2015 and an eight-year sentence. And I remember uh, it was actually Jeremy who interviewed you at the time, and I've listened to that interview. Yeah. And he said at that time, back in 2015, that it was a weight off your shoulders to know that he was going to be uh, uh, locked up for years to come. A short five years later, and he is back out on our streets. Is that weight now back on your shoulders? Uh, Emma, let me ask you that. Yeah, it is. Um, because when he was in prison, I knew where he was. Um, now that he's back out, he could be anywhere. Mm. You know, and he's still young enough to offend. He's only 60 years of age. Um, yeah, so it kind of is a bit. Um, the only thing I'm holding on to is that people know our story, know him, know his face, know what we went through and actually people believe us now because back then nobody believed us, family and all. And in um, fact, in in the photographs in the papers um, over the last 24 hours, uh, there he is with a flat cap on, a face mask on, uh, so it's kind of difficult to necessarily recognise him, but there have been photographs of him in circulation, haven't there? Yeah. And you see, this is the thing. COVID is ideal for paedophiles to hide their faces. Mm. Because yeah. they, we, we all have to wear masks. So it suited him to come out of prison like that. Um, the cap, he was always like that. And Vanessa, for you, knowing he's back on the streets again, uh, does that concern you for yourself or concern you for others? Both. Um, I suppose it's kind of a case where we're kind of looking over our shoulders a little bit to know where he, like, you know, where he is and stuff. Um the possibility of meeting him is huge because he is only living in the area we're living in too, you know. So, yeah, it's difficult. It's difficult because like that, I don't want to be bumping into him either, but there is that possibility. Now, for both of you, obviously, uh, seeing him being convicted was um, a a, a fantastic achievement and it took him off the streets for uh, a short period of time, as it happens, of, of just five years. He's now back out, but... The, the spin-off of all of this is that uh, it has affected your uh, relationships with the rest of your family because, um, for example, uh, Vanessa, do you have any relationship with your mother now? No. None. No? I have no relationship with my mother, no. And, and you the same, Emma, yeah? Yeah, no, and I never will. Why is that? Um, she's stuck by him. Um, 
she's supposed to, like a mother, uh, being a mother myself, you protect your kids. If my kids came to me and told me that something like that was happening, I'd, I'd, I'd go to prison myself for starting it out. But she'd done nothing. She ignored us, said that we were looking for attention, and stood by him for five weeks in a courtroom holding his hand, and I was across at the other side looking at that. Um, so basically, in a nutshell, she bed, made her bed, she can lie in it. And I, I, I can hear from both of you, you both feel uh, the exact same way. And, I mean, uh, that's just a, a side effect of of, uh, of this abuse. And, uh, is she, did she visit him when he was in prison? Yeah, yeah. Hmm. So that has to be a real um, difficult thing for you to, to, to take on board. It's not really surprising, you know, because she stood by him all along. She's going to stand by him still, you know. Out of you other siblings that, that you don't talk to? Yeah, we have two brothers, two younger brothers that we would have grown up with that we have no relationship with now. That's terribly sad. It really, really is. Um, so, the, like I said, one of the things I admire about both of you is that uh, back in 2015, you decided to waive your anonymity, um, which is something that you have the right to do. And as a result, he was named, uh, he was identified and can continue to be identified because he waived your, your right to anonymity. Let me ask you, Vanessa, is that something that you're glad you did uh, back then and now? Yeah. Yeah, I'm glad I did it because not only did we show him for what he was and show people his face, that he, if the chance of him doing it again was none. And the, the amount of people that we actually helped come forward is huge. And the amount of posts and comments that we got, we helped so many girls come forward. And we've had personal interactions with some of the women that came forward and some of the men that came forward as well. So we're we're very proud of ourselves for waiving our rights because we have to help so many people around the country and further to come forward. And for you, um, Vanessa, it, coming forward has led, like, like you said, to interactions with other people in similar situations. And I understand uh, your other sister has set up a helpline, is that right? Laura has set up a helpline she has with Shanita Daly. Oh, um, right, Shanita. Oh, yeah, we've spoken to Shanita many times, yeah. Yeah, herself and Shanita set up a, a group called Survivor Side by Side and it has grown over the last number of years and there's so much support with each other within that group for everybody that's on it. And uh, that website again is? Survivor Side by Side. Survivor Side by Side, okay. And uh, in fact, some, I've just been sent a photograph of... Of that man uh, standing side by side, holding hands at the fireplace with your mother. That must be... Uh, no, it, uh, it's not a recent photograph, I assume. Uh, no. It's from before they were before he was sentenced. But still, um, they may well be repeating that now. And uh, there's no indication that she's not still standing by him. Uh, do you know, has he gone home to the house that they were living in? Or do you know where he is in this country? Yeah, he's... He's gone home. He's gone home to Cooscloony in Tem- in Turles, just in Tipperary. Mm-hmm. Um, we have good friends still out there, um, so we know he's gone home. This guy's name is John Joe Patterson. He is 60 years of age. He uh, looks fairly fit and healthy. Um, what is your uh, warning, Emma, to the general public about this man? In my opinion... He's still a dangerous man. Um, and he is young enough to reoffend again. So just watch out for him, basically. Exactly, mm. yeah. As I said, you have uh, both of you have uh, my utmost admiration for your bravery in, in going public with your story and it is with that bravery that other people become aware of uh, people like him and uh, obviously he will be on the sex offenders register and all of that but yeah. uh, people need to know what he looks like in order to basically avoid him at all costs. Yeah, yeah. Vanessa and Emma, thank you both very much for uh, talking to us. I hope this release doesn't make your life any more uh, difficult. I hope uh, you don't bump into him and you don't have to see him again and uh, that you can both uh, get on with your lives. And I appreciate you talking to us on 98FM.
Thanks very Thank much. You. Thanks very much indeed. That is Vanessa and uh, Emma Witherow uh, about the release of their stepfather, John Joe Patterson, who was released from uh, Midlands Prison yesterday after only five years in prison for abusing two little girls. You're listening to 98 FM's Dublin Talks. This is Adrian Kennedy. We're here until uh, midday today. The sound of the city from Clondalkin to Clontarf. This is 98 FM's Dublin Talks with Adrian Kennedy. Just a little uh, add-on to that conversation with the two uh, sisters. I just got a text in a second ago and it says, Oh my God, that story is identical to my own, except I wasn't brave enough to do what those two uh, sisters did. Like that, my mother stood by my stepfather who abused me and let our family be torn apart over him as I was not believed either initially. Those sisters are very brave and should be very proud of themselves. And then uh, another message, I, I can't believe this, I just read that they had a homecoming party for him. It makes me absolutely sick. Reading stories like this is why I and others like me stay silent. And the message says, uh, don't use my name. I don't have your name to use your name. So um, anyway, I I really appreciate and really grateful to uh, those two ladies, Emma and Vanessa, for talking to us and for highlighting. And they're they're not going to stop talking. Uh, In fact, I believe they're doing a national television interview um, on Virgin Media later on today. So they are... um, going to keep that man's name out there so fair play to them now next on the program in a moment we'll be hearing from a secondary school teacher called ben who says that in the school he works in there are lots of measures in place to keep students and teachers safe uh, but he says that it's almost impossible to keep things completely safe from COVID-19. Now, the reason we're mentioning this is because of the possibility of secondary teachers going on strike. Question is, would you support such a strike? If you have a child in secondary school, how would you feel about a possible uh, strike? Do you think enough is being done to protect teachers from COVID-19? The Association of Secondary Teachers in Ireland has said that strikes are an option on the table as it begins to ballot members for industrial action due to COVID-19 safety concerns in schools. Uh, The Secondary School Teachers Union said uh, yesterday that a number of key issues have emerged since schools uh, reopened that cause concern. Issues raised include physical distancing in schools, provision of PPE for staff, the definition of close contacts, comprehensive testing and uh, turnaround times, provision for high-risk teachers and IT resources for students and teachers to facilitate more remote teaching or learning. Now, um, some comments that have come in about teachers uh, online, for example this, teachers had the luxury... I don't know if it was a luxury, but anyway, uh, of spending six months in the safety of their own homes while the rest of the country kept the show on the road while risking their lives when there was no clarity to any safety concerns, i.e. healthcare staff, frontline workers, supermarket employees. It's endless. Get on with it, said uh, George. I'd love to hear from you on 67979081 and I'd also like to have a broader conversation about how safe you feel in your own uh, workplace. Call me on 67979081. You can text, you can WhatsApp or send a WhatsApp voice note to 0877 989898. 0877 Let's have a listen to uh, this WhatsApp uh, voice note because obviously he is in uh, class, so was unavailable to talk to us live. Uh, so Ben, a secondary school teacher, sent us this WhatsApp voice note earlier. Hi, 98 FM. Um, I'm a post-primary teacher and I just want to say that um, I can understand why the ASCI is balancing its members to strike based on um, the safety measures in schools. Um, in my school, anyway, 
there's all the all the measures being put in place there's markings on the floors where kids will socially distance one or two meters where possible there's sanitization stations outside every single classroom um, we try to keep the kids as as distance apart inside the classroom um, but it's it's an extremely difficult thing to do um so certainly in in my school anyway there's there's say a system where the kids will actually go around say a, a certain pathway and get their lunch they will be physically uh, socially distanced uh, one or two meters apart and then when they get their lunch they will go into a separate uh, into the center of the canteen and they will have their lunch but the problem is that they will all congregate in the center of the canteen and they'll be all over each other on top of each other and there's no social distance going on and at this point in the center of the room the kids aren't wearing masks obviously because they're eating their lunch um, so I mean uh, when the kids come out of the canteen and when they go back to classes you know you, you, we, we have it that I mean the teachers now move around the classrooms the kids don't but that's only sustainable to a certain point you know you can do that for a certain amount of classes as many as possible but you can't do it for every single class so there is going to be one or two points in a day where the students will have to move a classroom um, uh, based on the logistics uh, they, they would just have to move classroom um, so there's in in my school there is a lot of measures in place but uh, it's 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 very very difficult if not impossible to have uh, those safety measures to maintain those safety measures at all times um, so I've also heard in other schools as well of classroom sizes being above the 30s I'm lucky enough that my classroom is I mean the most students I have in my classroom is say 28 thereabouts um, so I mean you can maintain some sort of social distancing but I mean if you have higher than 28 it's very very difficult and sometimes you can't even do it based on the size of classrooms um, but luckily enough there is only a high the high 20s in my school I haven't heard of any high 30s or an, an cropping into 30s in my school but there is other schools with that um, so I can I can see that the TUI uh, sorry that the ASCI um, why the ASCI is balancing its members to strike and I can see that the TUI is going to follow suit after after a while um, and then it will be very interesting to see exactly what happens with all the schools um, so that's all we got to say on that so take care love the show um, All right, Ben, thank you very much indeed. That was sent in to us uh, yesterday uh, from a teacher describing how it is very, very difficult for uh, teachers and supporting um, uh, teachers in uh, striking if they have to because of their uh, concerns over how difficult it is to keep your distance and everything else, particularly in secondary school. I'd like to hear from you on 6797981. Uh, Martina, you've heard um, uh, that particular teacher, Ben, describe how difficult it is in school. What did you, what, what's your view on this for teachers who are concerned? I, I think it's interesting that you said particularly secondary schools because I feel secondary schools can socially distant distance more. Um, 
like the teachers don't really need to go around to the students, not as much as they would with primary school teachers, where they'd have little people coming running up to them and wanting them to help tie laces or anything. Like, 100% they should be provided with PPE, mm-hmm. but I don't agree with a strike because, I mean, what what makes teachers different to retail workers? Because, my, uh, yeah, because mo- most people in most other jobs aren't with uh, 30 people in a room, albeit somewhat socially distanced. Um, you know, I'm in work every day and have been in work every day since the pandemic began, but I'm not squashed into a room with 30 other people. Yeah, but it there is are very, It is very different. Mm, I don't know. There are shops, there are offices where people are in a room together. Yes, but not not in uh, like in our office here, for example. All of our desks are well spaced out, much more than they ever were in the past, and we keep away from each other. So it's actually a very safe work environment. I would imagine secondary school is not as safe a work environment. Yeah, I see where you're coming from, but the teachers themselves would be well spaced back from students, I think. It's the students are more on top of each other than a teacher would be. OK, do me a favour, Martina. Stay on the line there for one second. I have to take a very quick break and uh, we'll come back after that. And I'd like to hear from you on 67979981. You can text, you can WhatsApp or send a WhatsApp voice note. 90. It's 11 o'clock across Dublin. Good morning. This is Adrian Kennedy. This is 98FM's Dublin Talks. And this is Emma with Tuesday's Top Headlines. Thanks, Adrian. Good morning. €245,000 worth of drugs have been seized at Dublin Airport. Two men and a woman in their 20s who arrived on a flight from mainland Europe were detained on Sunday after swallowing around 280 pellets of cocaine. There have been 14 new admissions to Irish hospitals with COVID-19 in the last 24 hours, the highest daily figure since the end of May. 94 people are now in hospital compared to 23 a month ago. An 18-year-old man has suffered hand injuries after a firework exploded in Palmerstown last night. Night. It happened in the Glenmarine Road area at around 9 o'clock. And an electric lorry company in the US produced a promotional video showing a truck rolling down a hill to make it appear it was driving. The head of Nicola has resigned over allegations of fraud. And now you're up to date on 98. 98 FM. Dublin Talks. Call 6797 981. And we're here until midday today. Good morning from Adrian Kennedy. Uh, we're in the middle of a conversation uh, about teachers, secondary school school teachers in particular, who are concerned about their exposure to the virus, basically, uh, in, war, in, in work, which happens to be in school. Uh, the ASTI, the Association of Secondary Teachers in Ireland, has said that strikes are an option on the table as it begins to ballot members for industrial action due to safety concerns in schools. Here's a WhatsApp voice note from Tracy. Hiya Adrian, Um, I don't have a secondary school child, I do have a primary school child, Um, we had to be tested last week, Um, I am driving through the town every day and I can see gangs of students from secondary school walking home together, um, messing, you know, pushing each other, all that sort of Obvious. We've obviously heard on the news over recent days about parties happening um, in Dublin and it's and me um, and all over the country. To be fair, it's an international pandemic. Um, I don't think it's fair to say all oh, teachers had the luxury of six months off. I personally was receiving educational packages for my child um, during the school term when the teachers were off, so they weren't actually at home doing nothing um but yeah i think we need to to focus on the virus if it's if this virus is as serious as it has been documented to be um the teachers i don't think should be put into a, a position where they're going into a school setting with A lot of, let's be honest, at times irresponsible teenagers um, who are 100% not wearing masks walking in and out of school because we've all seen them. Um, So, yeah, I just don't understand why teachers are being placed in that position. And that's exactly the point that the ASTI are making. Neve, you're on 98FM. Hiya, Neve. 
Hi, Adrian. How now, are you? Neve, you actually support the teachers here uh, who are concerned about uh, protective measures to protect them, basically. Yeah, I do support them because I have two children in secondary school and to be honest, I'm not happy with them sitting in an overcrowded classroom. Um, I think something else should have been done, maybe split the class half in the morning, half in the afternoon. There's no social distancing going on and I personally don't think it's a safe environment Mm. for kids or teachers. Or teachers, yeah. Well, well, the reality of it is that particularly when uh, they're out of school, I've was in Swords yesterday afternoon, saw gangs of uh, teenagers on their way home from school and they were certainly not socially distancing or uh, wearing masks or anything. Um, And obviously that's the concern that teachers have. It's one thing having some control over them in the classroom, but for sure when they're outside the classroom, there's no control at all. Yeah, that's, that's exactly true. But I suppose if they're going to school, they're going to meet up with their friends. And at the end of the day, the day they're teenagers, and it's, a lot of them don't understand how serious the virus is. Yeah, I agree with you, 100%. Um, a lot of them don't, and all you have to do is look at the way they walk home from school to realise that they, they don't uh, and aren't taking it uh, overly seriously. But what's the other alternative, Neve? Um, well, as, as I just said to you, why wasn't the class split half in the af- morning and half mm. in the afternoon? OK, they might be in a full day, what they could do a little bit maybe online then as well, combine it. I okay. mean, what do they do at lunchtime? They're all piled out together. I mean, it, it's, it doesn't make sense. Mm. It's crazy. Okay, so you um, can understand how teachers are um, very concerned about their exposure or um, the the issues that they're concerned about. And just to give you an idea of what they are again, uh, physical distancing in schools, provision of PPE, the definition of close contacts, comprehensive testing, uh, turnaround times, provision for high-risk teachers and IT resources so that more remote learning. I mean, do we really want our kids back home again learning? Well, I don't want them back home. I want my kids in school, but I want them to be in a safe environment. I don't think the government has done enough to support schools to create a safe environment for the children and for teachers. All right, stay there for one second. 67979081 is our telephone number. Text WhatsApp or send a WhatsApp voice note to 0877989898. Jason, you're on 98FM. How are you, Jason? Morning, Adrian. Uh, Now, Jason, what did you want to say? Um, if teachers don't feel safe, they don't have to go to work, but they don't get paid. Or they go on the, the COVID payment, or the, whatever that payment, that pandemic payment will cost. And let's see that sh- uh, soften up their, their stance a bit. Adrian, come on, it's not a pandemic the way it's making it out to be. The media have saturated, and I mean saturated people with words like death, pandemic, lockdown, lockdown. The country is broke because of it. And what, I, are and do, and okay. our, what are we going to do, Adrian? Take all our kids out of Oh, because a handful of teachers and who have a very, very tough uh, union. We all know what the ASTI is like. They, they have a grip on this country. If they pull the plug on teachers' kids, this country is screwed. People have to give up work to mm. look after their kids. But, uh, so, look, I totally understand that, Jason. But the point that I was no. making is I'm, I'm in a work environment. I'm, I'm one of the lucky ones, OK? Um, well, I how am... are you lucky? Why, why do people say they're lucky? What's this look? Hey, this thing is killing people. It's... It, a bad virus. I'm not denying that. But unless we stop using these words like death, lockdown and pandemic, the country's never going to get back. Where's the mention of all the people that are killing themselves over it? Still very quiet in the news. I know you brought it up. Fair play to you. Yes, we did. Not yeah. a lot of other people ain't bringing it up. I mean, the stuff we're reporting on is second. Silly. The, the, the press dying. Not about the 10 people that died last week in Galway. It's suicide. I think the press have got this. I think you are, you are running this story that the government are seeding now to. I don't know why you are running it. Nobody seems to want to challenge them. And any time anybody challenges them in the, in the HSE, they seem to be dismissed as cracks. I'm listening to both sides, and the other side I'm listening to, the figures ain't, ain't adding up to why we're destroying this country and destroying young people's education. 
Put fit young teachers in the schools. Put fit young teachers and anybody with underlying conditions are over a certain age. Sorry, if you don't feel safe, go on home, but you're not getting paid. But the point I was making is, um, I feel safe in work. We have uh, yeah. protocols in place. We've perspex screens. We're all separated from each other. So I feel perfectly safe going to work. I don't know how I'd feel if I was in a workplace that I didn't feel safe. And if well, teachers... Can well, then give it up. Adrian, I'm in one of probably the most dangerous jobs uh, in the world. We walk on the roads. Right? We could be killed any day by a stray driver, right? You don't see me giving it up. It's part of the life. There's dangers in everything. Okay, the teachers sit there with a mask on them and a visor. Plenty of hands on for to be grand. If they're young and fit and healthy, there's nothing to worry about. Mm, is, it, is it as simple 99.9% as that? 99.9% of people survive this thing, Adrian. We are destroying the world for, what, point one point two for percentage of people. It, that's a, it, that sounds very callous, though, Jason. Well, some come people, some if, if people we don't are get sacrificable. The, if we don't get the country back up and running, how many more fit, healthy people are we going to lose through suicide, through deprivation, if we don't get the country back up and running? I'm sorry for the people that have passed away. I really am. I mean, I'm not a, a heartless person, but there's a bigger picture out there. Okay, stay there for one second. I'd like to hear from you. Six seven nine seven ninety eight one. He's basically saying, if you don't like it, get out of the job. Um, as his message to teachers. Phil has little sympathy as well. Adrian, it's very easy to sit at home on full pay, and very easy to go on strike on full pay. Very, very simple. What are people out there are getting on with things? Why can't they? And Tommy sent me uh, this message. He is a college lecturer. Also, the difference between most retail workers and um, not all, obviously, because the restaurants are out there, um, but the schools or colleges is that we are working with 30 people, as mentioned previously, but also other people um, all day. We're with them for hours at a time. It's not like a retail uh, shop where people come in and out. 15 minutes, they're gone, and they have been gone. Um with sectors where your customers are going to be hanging around for a while and where you do need to get close to them. You do need to, to sit down with them when they're having trouble with their work and find out what the issue is. Like, I don't really know how it's going to be practical, to be honest, but, um, yeah, like, what can we do? All right, and um, Rebecca sent me this uh, WhatsApp voice note. Uh, her brother is a secondary school teacher. Adrian, um, my brother's currently in sixth year in the school in Kildare, and he was letting us know yesterday that they're going to keep the windows open all winter because they don't have ventilation. So, like, just think secondary schools are being bleeding ridiculous with all of this. Like, more should be done and schools shouldn't keep their windows open, especially during winter. Like, it's going to be minus odd degrees, like. All right, Rebecca, sorry, your brother is in secondary school. My apologies. Now, uh, Radwa, you're on 98 FM. How are you? How are you, Adrian? Good, thank you. What what did you want to say on this? Uh, Actually, uh, as I said before, I'm not against uh, anybody striking or with the strike at all. But uh, then I say, if teachers would go to strike next day, tomorrow, uh, the hotel service management and the hotel staff would go on strike, doctors would go on strike, uh, me, uh, a home carer, go for strike because there is not enough anything, PPE or uh, enough social distancing, or I'm fearing that I will catch the COVID-19 from anything. So the problem is, um, if teachers say there is not enough um, uh, PPE or uh, enough uh, uh, social distances between uh, the, the, the school uh, students or uh, in high school particularly. Uh, for myself, I will speak from my uh, point of view and mm. my own experience. I have three kids in primary school, uh, in uh, secondary school, first year, and my kids go to school with their masks on. They have their masks on uh, in the school. During the classes, uh, it's only they have mask breaks during lunchtime and they have the social distancing between each and everybody. In the break time, they are not allowed to be in touch with their friends, even not touching their hands or just they have to to be separate. Like they have to talk one meter between them at least. Uh, There is lines, there is... um, uh, there is no canteens in the secondary school. They are all closed. You cannot bring anything from home. You cannot take anything from school. And uh, there is lots of measures done. 
So uh, I'm not sure why they're be like afraid they get some kind of uh, infection from the schools, from the students, uh, if they are already uh, having their own safety measures from home, even and in the school. And teachers... Uh, the, are... the, the worry is that, um, and I saw this myself yesterday, uh, gangs of kids uh, on the way from home from school, no social distancing, um, on top of each other. I, I don't know what I saw. One young fella giving another a jiggy back and well, just mucking yeah. around as teenagers I, I, do. Yes, yes, I know what you're coming from. But the problem is it's not... Uh, it's happening everywhere. Like um, you can see this not with the school kids. It's happening with the adults, with the with 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 teachers there. Because you can see the teachers outside the school, they are gathering and talking together. There is no social distancing. So why are they are afraid from the kids getting them infected while they are doing the same thing like outside? I'm not uh, judging anybody, but just I'm saying is uh, what I'm saying is everybody in his uh, workplace might be uh, infected somehow. Uh, God forbid. Uh, but it's kind of, it's not kind of, we have to live with this uh, virus now because if everybody now going out, uh, striking or uh, kind of staying like we have to, to close everything, then we're not going anywhere. Uh, the, the, vi- the vaccine is not going to come out at least it's one year. Mm. It's uh, clinically, it's not proven like there is no trials, there is no uh, side effects. We have to have it's not tried as well. So if you're thinking that you have to stay home until the vaccine is out and everything has to stop, I don't think this will get the country to anywhere. Not even the teachers. It's everyone. Because everyone is go back to strike. Because uh, why would I go to work when everybody is sitting at home and taking the money? I think if everybody is afraid, anybody, for me, if I am the teacher and I, I fear for my life or getting infected or anything, I might stay at home. Uh, that's what I... That's what I um, think about. I might stay home until I think it's safe to do so, then I can go back. But to stay home, um, what to say, uh, <clears throat> take the COVID-19 payments and then we're staying back home and then back to school and then we are afraid to go back home, uh, to go out. So I don't think this is a this is a point, to be honest. Mm. Everybody uh, is uh, getting to his opinion. I don't mind. Like it's no judge. It's my opinion. They, I respect their opinion. They have maybe different points of views. But um, what I'm saying is, we have oh, we have to be to cope on uh, with this virus and take just the precautions. And okay, but uh, you believe that with precautions, there's no need for teachers to um, go on strike. Their concern, though, is that there aren't enough precautions. Let me have a listen to this WhatsApp uh, WhatsApp voice note. Well, Adrian, uh, getting back with God of the teachers, um, I've just finished a, a 12-hour shift on the front line, just on three shifts in a row, off tonight, back in tomorrow night for another two. Um, I am exposed to the limit. So these teachers seem to be very precious. Are they looking for another five months off fully paid? Jesus, lads, cop on with you. You have a handy enough you have. Cheers, guys. No, I mean, that's from a frontline worker. Here's another WhatsApp voice. Morning, note. lads. Uh, I can't come on there. Just a quick one on that. I don't understand for the life of me why they didn't produce an, an advertisement on the TV. There's loads of them for everything about COVID on the telly and on the radio. But why didn't they not produce them directly aimed at like the likes of teenagers where the mass uh, groups and the parties and all are being organised. You know, that's where I think we're getting a lot of our problems from and, you know, the early 20s and late 20-year-olds. There should be some kind of an advertisement aimed at them and to show them the effects of what they're doing and what the the fallback is on it, like, you know? All right. Uh, Prudence, you're on 98FM. How are you? I'm good, how are you? Good, thank you. Mm-hmm. You don't necessarily support uh, teachers striking? No. More especially secondary school. I have a child, she's in secondary school. The, like, I give her three masks just to change. They have, they wear their mask. They have one-way system. It's only few in the class. And they do their social distancing. They eat outside. Like... Like, if there's no, it's raining, the school will always find a way. You get my point? And they check their temperature in the morning. There's a sensor to check their temperature. There's hand sanitizers. The teachers wear masks. They wear masks. Hmm. The people that I will be worried about, it's the ones in primary school. Like, I have ch- kids, two of them in primary school. Last week, they had to get, she had to get tested because she had a cough. 
There's no social distancing there, only one meter. There's no mask. So those are the people that I feel like they are not really safe. But secondary school, that's ridiculous. Okay, so um, you believe that if anybody was to go on strike, it should be healthcare workers uh, because it be yeah, healthcare I mean, we all, all we have to do is look at the the amount of healthcare workers that actually uh, contracted this virus early on. Um, Myself, I'm a healthcare worker. Mm-hmm. I worked throughout the pandemic. No complaint. At the beginning, we had like no PPE, but we still went and worked. With absolutely no problem, we gave ourselves out. Coming back to our families, coming, I couldn't hold my kids for some for three months. I couldn't talk, I couldn't let them because my small one is asthmatic. She couldn't cuddle me. I couldn't hug her for three months until I feel safe. I had to come home, get off my clothes at the door. But in the morning, I woke up and went to work. All right, so um, you wouldn't support teachers going on strike. Let me have a listen to uh, a few more WhatsApp voice notes. This is from Anthony. Hi, Adrian. I'm sure every issue the teachers have regarding health and safety can be resolved by a healthy pay increase. This, again, is another method of using this time COVID as an excuse to gain more income and that's the only reason we have trade unions in this country essentially running Ireland. Okay, Tracy sent me this message. Hey Adrian, I think Jason needs to realise that this is not only happening in Ireland. Like if you look in the UK, if you look in France, if you look in Italy, if you look in America, this is a pandemic. You mightn't like it, but it is. And it's everywhere. And he said he works on the road, so I'm not too sure now, maybe I'm wrong, but if he works for the council, so they are so protected. They have their split shifts. They have to wear their masks. They have to protect each other. For for a while there, sure, they were only working two hours in the morning. And I know that myself because my uncle did. Does He works so, like, he's in a protective uh, employment place, you know. So I, I stand by the teachers. It has been wrong. It is wrong. Nobody is standing in a room with 30 children or 25 children all day for six hours no one no other job is doing it no like it's just ridiculous jason he, he's very one-sided he's very it seems to me he's against the teachers but the usual lot the teachers get paid for sitting at home crap all this talk at the end of the day if the teachers are not safe in their workplace well then they're right they're right to stand up for it and this should have been blended learning it should have been half and half to cut the class sizes and parents could go to work and anyone that could keep the children home could keep them home and do the blended learning or continue with the books or assignments it, it wouldn't really be that hard to, to sort out okay thanks all right tracy thank you very much indeed jonathan is a supermarket worker who has no sympathy for the teachers bye adrian I work in um, retail in a major supermarket that deals with 100 people a day, hundreds of people a day. Um, so we do, we just wear our PPE, mask, whatever, hand sanitizer, and uh, just get on with our job. Um, I don't know why teachers can't do the same. Um, we're told that we don't feel safe in the job, not to come in, and we won't be paid. Um, I think it should be the same for them. Like, if they don't want to work, um, stay at home and just don't get paid for it. It's that simple. All right, Jonathan, thank you. Sarah? So we can't sacrifice the teachers, but it was all right for not even the nurses and doctors, but say the supermarket workers and that to work flat out for the whole lockdown with no protection or anything because at the time face masks were useless and blah, blah, blah. And that was okay for the whole of lockdown for the last six months or whatever. The teachers are back a week or two, and now they're whinging that they like that it's not okay. How does that make sense at all? Uh, just a couple more WhatsApp voice notes. This is Tony. What about the couriers and truck drivers? Throughout the COVID first lockdown, we were the only ones out there working with all the shopkeepers and supermarkets. So what happened? What would happen now if all drivers, couriers, truck drivers? deliveries for food, anything at all. What if we all took a strike? So, like, it's okay for us to go out and deliver food and deliver parcels and drop and knock off your knock off to your houses and go into shops and drop off stuff into shops, but it's not okay for teachers to stand in skills. No. Stay in skills. 
get on with it. All right, Tom says they're being drama queens. Hey, Adrian. Could we not wait and see to see what sort of numbers and statistics are coming out of the school before we go on strike? Stop being such drama queens. And finally, uh, this WhatsApp voice note from John. Hi, guys. Great show, by the way. Regarding your topic today, the teacher, they have all the right to be worried about their health and safety while are at school, but they're adults mature enough to know how to protect themselves, to wear masks, wash their hands, and also encourage their poopers to do the same. And of course, they will have uh, 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 students who will uh, be against, but that's why they're teacher. They're there to, to teach them. Uh, it will be easy to stay at home again. I don't say about payments and everything, and leave the work, the whole uh, homework to the to the parents to do with their kids. But unfortunately, we need to be there. We need to go back on work. We need to bring the economy back on a uh, on track. Me and my wife we are back on work working because our bills, mortgage breaks are over, and the bills are coming over and over every every month. So. We risk it, but we try to protect ourselves for us and for our kids. All right, uh, John, thank you very much indeed. And one message finally. I completely support the teachers. My husband is a teacher in a secondary school. He was identified as a close contact to a confirmed case in his school and was told by the HSE that he could ignore that and go back to work the next day. Who knows how many other teachers have been told that? How many teachers and students are at risk because of HAC advice like that? All the teachers want is to be safe and for their students to be safe. All right. Uh, thank you very much indeed, all of you. For all of your calls, comments, texts and opinions, this is 98FM's Dublin Talks. On the way after the break, here's a question. Is it ever OK to put a child on a diet? <laughs> The sound of the city, from Perrystown to Port Marnock. This is 98FM's Dublin Talks with Adrian Kennedy. Now, our telephone number is 67979981. You can also text WhatsApp or send a WhatsApp voice note to 0877 98, 98, 98. There are two words that, when put together, cause a lot of controversy. Children and diets. Many people believe that a child should never know the word diet and that putting a child on a diet can cause them serious body image issues. But what should a parent do if their child is overweight? In a moment, we'll be hearing from a parent who wants this uh, brought up. She WhatsApped the show yesterday with her uh, dilemma. She's a 10-year-old son who's overweight. He wears a school uniform for a 12-year-old, and that barely fits him. Uh, so they uh, put him on a diet and told him that they were putting him on one. Her issue is the backlash that she has received from uh, family and friends over putting her child on a diet. And now she's wondering if she did the right thing and is also looking for advice on how a parent should deal with a child that either won't stop eating or is overweight. I want you to have a listen to uh, this WhatsApp message that was sent in to us yesterday. Uh, here it goes. Well, how's it going? Um, I'm having a bit of an issue, to be honest, with my uh, my 10-year-old son. He, he has a massive appetite and he just, like, he loves his food, did you know? And... Um, I went to get him his new uniform and he's 10, he's already in a 12 year old's uniform and it's just not fitting him and I'm just a little bit worried about his weight and I don't really know how to control it because he's just so, you know, he's so young to put him on a diet so like, and that's what I did, I started doing that, me and my husband, we said, you know what, let's just get him on a diet portion control and so that's what we do, that's what we've been doing, we told him, look, we're just going to reduce your diet, we have to do this, you know, it's important and the backlash I'm getting from family and friends saying that you should never put a child on a diet, it's just bizarre and like, I understand it to an extent, but I don't know what to do, do you know what I mean? Does anyone have any advice? All right, there you go. It's a difficult one because you can see your child is putting on weight 
Um, but the, the mention of the word child and diet in the same sentence really annoys a lot of people. And I want to find out what the issue is here. She is controlling his eating now to try and make him lose some weight. But the fear is that he may develop uh, body issues over uh, being put on uh, a diet. Our telephone number is 6797981. You can text, you can WhatsApp, or you can send a WhatsApp voice note to 0877 98 98 98. Is it ever acceptable to put a kid on a diet? That's the question. Um, maybe you're somebody who's had to do that. Maybe you're somebody who dealt with it differently. I mean, some kids go through phases of having weight and then it falls off them uh, as they grow older. Lauren, you're on 98FM. How are you, Lauren? Hey, yeah, good morning. Lauren, you're against the idea of putting children on diets. Why? I, um, you know, I think it's hard. <laughs> um, like I... Oh, sorry, Lauren, I we're, losing, we're losing you there. We've bad signal. Try that again. No. Lauren, I'll have to get the lads to ring you straight okay. back. Uh, really bad, really bad phone line. Um, Renata, you're on 98 FM. How are you? Hi. Hi, Adrian. How are you? Now, you're the complete opposite to Lauren. You actually think there's nothing wrong with putting a child on a diet. No, like, you don't go on the severe starvation diet, but you have to teach the kids how to develop a healthy eating habit. And you have to, like, not make them aware of their body issues but to make them aware of what could come afterwards. If the kids eat... What? Tell them getting fat isn't a good thing? Well, is it? There obviously isn't. Like you end up with diabetes you end up with a uh, hundred bunches of okay, but, uh, but, to, but to have that conversation you need to tell a child that they're heading in the wrong direction you're getting fat or whatever. Of course, of course yes, but there's a ways to do that. You don't come into the child's room and you say, listen, you're getting fat from tomorrow on, you're eating half of your portions of the food. There's a ways and there's you know, there's hundreds of ways how to go about it. I don't know, um, talk to your GP. I'm sure she'll be able to advise you and refer you to this you know, to the places that can help you with that. Like my kids have no eaten, my youngest one is extremely picky eater, but there's no issues with the weight with them. Not yet but I, I just don't believe that like when you stand at the school gate I can see so many kids walking out of the school that are very clearly obese like they're way beyond and God love them in the future what if she's going to grow up and he's going to say listen mommy how could you let this happen to me you are the one that was responsible you are the one that was supposed to show me the right way do you know what I'm saying okay so, an- so if it's necessary um, if a child and she describes how He's 10 and he's already in a school uniform for a 12-year-old, which barely yeah. fits him. Yeah. Y- you think that this is the right course of action? I'm, I'm 100% positive it's the right course of action. Don't go too hard on him, but like, there's definitely have to be a way of trying to explain it to the child. Like, I think that we should maybe try um, new sports. That I think that maybe we should all, as a family, choose healthier options of our dinners or our snacks. Or, you know, like there's definitely the ways of that. Like, I am... I am I, all my life. I was way underweight, but my mom, she's like really, really big woman, and she always taught us that you have to. But she's with the health issues. That's why she's big, and she always taught us you have to eat healthy. You have to do the things to make you, you know, to develop into the future, so you can sit down and enjoy your meal rather than just, you know, pouring it into you without even taste of flavour in it, just because you want something. I, I, I don't know how to explain this. Okay, so <laughs> so this lady's been given out to for putting her child on a diet and that um, children on diets... that's nobody's business, Adrian. The problem is, and that woman is doing the right thing, that's absolutely nobody's business. That child is her child. And when he grows up, she's the one that's going to have to deal with the overweight teenager that is conscious of her, of her or his body. Look at the, you know, all around you. Like Social media has so much influence onto our kids nowadays. And that child is going to be very much aware of his body weight. You okay, want but, well, stay you there for one second. Stay, stay there for one second. Let me. Uh, do I have Lauren back on the line again in a clearer line? Hi, can you hear me properly? I can. That's grand. So <laughs> Renata is saying quite clearly, yes, this is the right thing to do. Um, who wants a child turning around to you in ten years when they're huge, saying, "Mammy, you should have dealt with this when I was younger." 
And you know, I I do get that, and I and I totally understand that if she was to do nothing at all, that you know, parents would slate her for letting her child put on weight. But at the same time, I think the word diet is really wrong because I have a ten year old who has a habit of constantly wanting to go in and pick stuff out of the press and before dinner and after school. And I had to tell her no, like she can't. But I wouldn't. She's she's quite body conscious even at ten years of age. So instead of saying, okay, well I'm going to do this for you and something else for everybody else we all i kind of stopped buying all the crap so she couldn't well, have that, anything yes i just sorry for interrupting but that's the point in our house our youngest one is constantly scolding us for the sweets and the snacks and like you know unhealthy food the absolute this conversation between me and my husband was sitting down at the table we're not buying the stuff if we buy a bag of popcorn for our friday movie night we have we put it in the garage so he doesn't see it it doesn't see it it doesn't bother him and that's what I'm saying. Like, it's up to you as a parent to teach your child how to develop healthy eating habits. It's not every single day after dinner treat. It's not every single day after lunch treat. It's just the treat. It's called a treat because it's unhealthy. And you're only supposed to treat yourself every now and again, not every day. Do you know what I mean? And you I can think know, the and same you can only you... eat what you have in your house. If you don't buy it, they can't eat it. it so it, I just think that if you there. do it for the whole family instead yeah. of, you know kind of singling out one child because that child I know by my daughter um, will be very self-conscious um, of, of what she's eating, if she's eating something different than everybody else. I think that, you know, as, do it as a family and do it that way and don't buy anything that yeah. you want your child to put in their mouth. Yeah, she's 100% on that. Everybody has to be involved. Okay, but, uh, but the, the, the notion, Lauren, of put because I'm just looking, um, I'm surprised actually with the split on this from our uh, listeners. Um, a lot saying uh, the word diet should never ever be used around a child, uh, no matter what. The word diet does not mean starving yourself. The word diet is mean your food, your daily Moderating food your and controlling. Moderation, yes, yes. Yes, and controlling what you're eating. Child, starvation. Child, the diet is not to, to a child. You're saying you're fat. You need to go on a diet. That's the way a child. You don't is say going it that way. It. No, no. There's no way you have. No, no. You can't say it. But that you way. do have to have a conversation. You can't you suddenly start controlling to, yeah. food and um, and what they're taking. And the child saying, "Well, I, I, I want uh, that or I want that," um, and you say, "No." You have to eventually come yeah. to the point of, "Well, actually, child, you can't have that because you're too big." Yeah, well, not too big, but like, you know, I think it's not healthy for you. And I think we're all better off if we just cut this out and let's look instead of this, let's try this. And um, like, there's so many, many ways and there's books about this and books. I know like not everyone wants to, but you parents, you have to feel it in your own gut mm. what is right for your child and what okay, is Okay, well, stay there for one second. 6797981 is our telephone number. We're talking about um, a diet. And a child. And a message that we got earlier on. This is from Jonathan. She's a great man. She's saving our kid from diabetes and heart problems and all these things. And everyone needs to mind our business and leave her to raise our own kid. She's doing a great job. And by contrast, uh, Anne says a child should never know about a diet. Hi. The child should never know he's on a diet. It should come from the family. Healthy eating is the way. And if the whole family do it, he won't even know. I know, but it's very, very difficult um, if to, you know, if a child has certain eating habits, to suddenly change those eating habits um, and to enforce that, uh, I would imagine, is very, very difficult. We'll take a very quick break. A lot of interest in this. Children and diets is what we're talking about, and we're back in a second. The sound of the city, from Fur House to Finglas. This is 98FM's Dublin Talks with Adrian Kennedy. We're talking about a message that we got from a mother concerned about her 10-year-old uh, being overweight, wears a school uniform for a 12-year-old that barely fits him. Uh, so she's put him on a diet and told him that they were uh, putting him on one. Her issue is the backlash that she's received from family and friends saying, you never put a child on a diet. Let's hear um, a, a nanny's uh, perspective on hey, this. Hey, um, I don't have children of my own, but I'm a full-time nanny. Um, and although if if her child is overweight, yes, obviously something has to be done about it, he doesn't have to know it's a diet. Children will eat what you eat. And if you don't buy the things into the house and if you encourage healthy options and they see you eating it, they're going to eat it too. 
Um, a lot of the blame obviously lies with the parents, I think, because they need to be, like, they're the ones that buy the food. And also they need to be encouraged to exercise. Like, it's all about balance. And yes, they should have treats, but not every day of the week. Um, yeah, thanks. All right, uh, Nicola, thanks very much indeed. Danielle, you're on 98FM. Hi, Danielle. Hi, how are you? Good, thank you. Um, Danielle, a child and a diet. Well, see, I have two kids, a son and a daughter. There's 11 months between them. My daughter eats every vegetable, every fruit, every healthy thing. And my son just has to look at it and go, I don't like that. Mm. And she's heavier than him. She's heavier than him? Exactly, yeah. Even though she's the one who... Even though she eats, she'll eat watermelon, banana, butternut squash. uh, Broccoli's her favourite. She prefers brown bread if you are going to a subway, which we very very rarely go. But uh, the man was shocked because she asked for it. It wasn't me telling them. She eats all the healthier stuff. Her brother only eats carrots, um, only eats uh, bananas. And um, she would hold weight on her tummy and her brother wouldn't. You know, so I just think that kids are different. Yes, you have to watch what you're eating, but if you're watching what they're eating and they're still gaining, there's obviously one, an underlying problem, or two, they just have a different metabolism than the other child. And I would, she's very self-conscious and she's only nine, uh, which is horrible because I hate her being like that. She constantly puts herself down and... um, I'm saying that she's brilliant, she's clever, she's beautiful, she's everything, but she will still, and I think it's got a lot to do with this day and age with kids in class, so there is no way I would actually tell her she's on a diet, but I have but, watched her food, it, it, or I have You know, we talk her. about the cruelty in class. Um, yeah. If a child is of a certain size, um, they will be told by their classmates. Mm-hmm. No, she's not, she's not huge. No, I'm not saying you, specifically your daughter. Yeah. I'm talking about bigger kids in general get but picked on because of on that. Her. I can only go on her because she's mine, like, you know, but she would hold weight on her tummy. She's not over, she's not massive, but she does have weight on her. Um, but I have watched her food and I have tried to cut out things that I may think that are triggering it. But she eats normally, especially more over COVID, I suppose, mostly the same as her brother, if not more veg and fruit, because they're not going to friends' houses as they used to, you know, that kind of way. She could have been snacking there or whatever. Well, you know, I give him, like if they're having a treat, he has the same treat that she has. And yet she's eating more veg and fruit, but she will get more, but she would hold more weight on her tummy and there's not a pick on him. He is also very tall for his age, where she is average for hers, but there's only 11 months between them. So you have to go on their their height. Their, you have to take everything into consideration. But obviously... And in fact, we, like we he, got a message in a while ago uh, from one of our listeners saying that when she was 10, 11, 12, she was very big compared to the rest of her class, but they all caught up on her over time. Um, in other words, it balanced out over time. Yeah, well, I also noticed as well that, okay, like I know this year could kind of can't go by it, but normally then when like things kicked in back into place, like she used to do horse riding and swimming and stuff like that, this year she hadn't gone back to that. So I normally see during the summer that she'd kind of lose a bit of weight. You know, that kind of way because she's out more, she's running more. You're not getting home at like, you know, finishing homework at six in the evening she only has an hour or two hours play in the summer she had longer because the longer stretch of evenings and stuff like that so I always found that in the summer she'd lose in the winter she'd gain a bit but like I said there's I can only compare my two together because they're mine and I know but there's 11 months between them he's slightly taller than her he's re- there's not, not a pick on him and he's the one that will tell you he'll even you know tell you that he doesn't like carrots even though I mushed them up for years and told them they were butternut squash but you can do that thing with kids do you know what I mean Okay, well, well, that way let's have though. a listen to um, to this message from Tracy. Hi, Adrian. I have a ten year old, and I have her on a diet. Um, she started putting on a little bit of weight, and I want to put a stop to her because I can't let herself. I don't want her to ruin herself. I let myself go, and there's no way in hell I'm going to let her ruin her body. And she, yeah, don't get me wrong, she does have a little bit of a moan and all, but she also understands she doesn't want to be a fatty. Oh, no, and that's. I, don't, I hope she hasn't had that conversation with her ten-year-old. Don't don't be a fatty. Like I think saying stuff like that to your kids can be more damaging than the weight. 
the weight you can lose, the self-esteem that you have to build that is a hard part. By all means... I know, but, uh, but by, by contrast, um, the, the grief you would get if you are an extra large child would also add to your self-esteem issues. I get that too, but the adults should be the ones that are controlling that and not have to say and say, here, you're not going to be a fatty. I don't know if that woman has said it to her child. No, I hope but she hasn't. But if I came out and said that to my daughter, I know that she would be hysterical because I had said that to her. So I won't use those type of words. And I will just control her portions a bit more. And I will, you know, maybe if her brother's getting like a treat on a Friday and he'll have two things and maybe she'll have one or, you know, that kind of way. And without having to say, you're fat. You need to go on a diet. There's ways and means about doing it without having to physically... Okay, all right. So, uh, we'll stay there for one second. Let's have a listen to uh, some more of your WhatsApp voice notes. Steph says that the mother is doing the right thing here. Uh, hi, Adrian. People are absolutely ridiculous. What that woman did was completely right, putting her child on a diet. And it's because of the twisted way that we have gone about diets or the word diet um, in life that people think dieting is an awful thing. It's not. She is portion controlling. She's going to limit the amount of sugar he intakes. She is going to make sure he gets enough exercise. She's going to make sure that he doesn't eat too much carbohydrates, which if it's not used, will turn into fat. Um, so people should just get off her back. She's doing absolutely the right thing. And I really hope that it works well for her and for him. She's a, They're good parents. They really are. All right. And Jeanette also uh, says something similar. Hey, Adrian. Um, about that lady there and her son, I think she should go to a dietitian and maybe map out a plan for him. Um, she shouldn't mind anybody, like... Don't mind anyone who's who's acting like that and saying, ah, oh, no, he shouldn't be doing that, he's only a kid. If you feel your child's health is in danger and you can see him getting bigger and bigger, I mean, there's obviously a problem there. So I think she's right and I think fair play to her because many parents wouldn't bother. So I think, yeah, go to a dietitian if you're not familiar with it um, and map out a plan for him that'll sue him. All right, thanks, bye. All right, Jeanette, thanks very much indeed. Sylvia says the word diet shouldn't exist. Hi guys, there is a simple answer to this. There is no diet ever exist. There is no, the word diet is completely wrong and no one should be even using it. It's a lifestyle lifestyle change. So easy for the 10 year old boy will be to call it lifestyle change and call it that um, they're all gonna do, especially when, I don't know if he has siblings, but if he and his siblings will get will get little changes, especially with parents, as a, as a parents, he will follow it because they will have small changes. So if they are trying to do something with the kid, I will bring it out for more walks. I'll definitely more uh, get more physically active, good for whole family. And then, yeah, call it lifestyle change. Don't call it diet because there is no diet in their life on no diet in the world. It's all about the lifestyle and about good choices what people make. So it will be easier if whole family will um, do the same thing and it will be easy for the boy. It's very easy to explain. He will understand he's then. Don't call it diet. It's really wrong. That's how it's going to affect him. There is no diet in their life and no diet in the world. Lifestyle. All right. Thank you very much indeed, Sylvia. Shane, you're on 98FM. How are you, Shane? How are you doing, Good, well, thanks, Shane. What did you want to say on this? Well, basically, we've, we've gone through uh, this situation with our own child. Our own Sorry, child. Shane, it's really hard to hear you. Are you on hands free or something? No, no, no. Um, I'm just putting it up on a bit here. Can you hear me a bit better now? No, it's dreadful. Really bad quality. Right, OK. Look, I'll uh, that's a bit better. That's a bit better. Go on. OK. Um, basically, what I was just trying to say is we've gone through this situation with our own eight, eight-year-old daughter. Um I think what happened was is there's been a hard road with her. We, we've noticed what happened. She was carrying a lot of weight. We made the decision as a family family to go down and try to make this help. And then I heard earlier on that there was a mention of a dietitian. We went down that road. We were basically told it's a genetics. You're just going to have to live with it. I mean, well, no, we're not doing that. Her self-esteem was so low. She was crying. She was upset. So she was looking at all the other children on the road doing bits and pieces. And it was just actually breaking our hearts. So we basically just turned around and said, right, as parents, let's get, let's sort this out. And that's what we did. But, um, I, we, and we, uh, and uh, sorting it out meant what? Putting her on a diet? Yes, exactly. And, and, and I'm not being on because we said, we, my wife said to me, you have to be cruel to be kind. And we never told her we, she was going on a diet. We told her we're going to make life changes. I said, I needed to be a bit more healthy. 
uh, and the rest of the family needed to be a bit more healthy and so she went on with it. Now there was a good little kid, there was a good little incentive as well, her communion was coming up and um, we, we said okay we go down we pick our dress, we pick the beautiful dress, the lady in the shop looked at it and went no. So then we said yes. Oh, well, sorry, uh, Shane, you, you need a new phone. <laughs> no, I think so. <laughs> you need to invest in a new phone. All right, Shane. Sorry, can I ask you, Shane, did it work? Yeah. It did. She lost a phone and a half. Oh, very good. Okay, fantastic. Yeah. Um, let's just squeeze in a couple of WhatsApps before we go. Thank you, Shane. Uh, get a new phone. Uh, Lisa. Hey, Adrian, um, this is Lisa. I'm just curious, like, that woman um, that has the child that's overweight, like, how did the child get to be overweight? And why did she wait so long? Like, if he's 10 and he's wearing a 12-year-old uniform, this didn't just happen, you know? And there's a lot a lot of focus on the diet, but there needs to be more focus on the parents' responsibility for allowing the child to be overweight. That's just my take on it. All right, Lisa, thank you. My apologies to you if you sent a WhatsApp voice note and uh, we don't have, we didn't get time to play because unfortunately we're out of time thank you very much indeed for all of your calls comments texts and opinions and as you can hear very split right down the middle over uh, what the right thing to do is anyway that's it from us for today thank you very much indeed for joining us we're back with you again tomorrow morning at 10 a.m and if you want to get in contact with us send us an email right now to dublin talks at 98 fm.com have a great Tuesday. I'll see you tomorrow morning. Barry Dunn is next with some great music lined up in the next hour. Like these. I love it, love it, love it. We used to be giant. I know what you're asking, but I left you adjusting. Can you feel me? Dublin's 98 FM.